Bonsoir to the moon. Welcome to Tom Play's Europe Universalis 4 for Absolute Beginners. And this time we're going to play France. So <laughs> just um, choose single player. Going to use all the default options. France is actually the first of the nations which is not recommended for new players. And funnily enough, I actually think in some ways they're easier to play than Portugal because they're richer, more powerful, but I think they're not recommended for new players because they're kind of complicated. So right, I'm just going to stick with the defaults. So this just gives us the background on France. This is more familiar ground for me. Uh, basically, we've had the Hundred Years' War with England, which has more or less just finished, partly thanks to Joan of Arc. Fascinating history there. And we kind of won. Kind of. So, the English have agreed to give up a province to us, which they haven't yet done. The Burgundians have been very disloyal. They kept trying to decide whether they were going to side with the English or with the French, because both had a claim to the French crown. In fact, terribly, technically not the French as such, more just with us, but we are now ruling France. So Burgundy is more or less a separate country and is going to cause us problems, and France itself is basically a whole bunch of different countries. So that's the background. This is to do with religion, we're currently Roman Catholic. We may stay that way, we may not, we will find out. This is just your general stuff. This mentions the Holy Roman Empire, which is going to be far more of a problem for us than for nations we've done in the past. So, to just the basics, to move around, so you just move your mouse pointer to the edges of the screen. And our country is primarily the blue bit. And as you'll see, we're heavily fractured. This is because France at this point isn't a unified country as such. We're actually made up of a whole bunch of nations, so we control most of this, the blue bit, but these nations, these ones, these ones, these ones, they all technically belong to us, they're vassal states. We start with an unusual number, which is one of the things we're going to have to get down. Anjou actually isn't a vassal state, it belongs to Provence, which is an ally of ours. The red ones, which are a big concern, belong to England. A lot of <laughs> our time as France is going to involve fighting the English. Because we... that's just tradition. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we do. And this is Burgundy. The nice Burgundy colour. Very appropriate. They also have a bunch of vassals. I think... Nevers is theirs. And a bunch of the low countries like Flanders, probably Holland, not entirely sure. But they certainly have a certain amount of power and Brittany is also independent. So yeah, it's going to be interesting. But oddly enough, I would generally consider France to be the most powerful nation in the game. More so even than the Ottomans because of the potential for colonising which we will get to in a bit. Okay, so you've got your main screen. There are quite a few things to consider. Up at the top right, we've got the time. We may not be starting that this episode. At the present, it's paused. And apart from stop, so there are five potential speeds that you can go at. You've got the date. This is where we start the game in 4044. It's gonna run until 1821. And there are a few details here which are quite handy to keep an eye on, but I'm not going to go into them just yet. Down here we have various maps. We start with four by default. This is terrain. Not too concerned with that. This is our standard map, the political one. Tells us most of what we need to know. This is trade, which we will cover later. Isn't that important just yet. This one is diplomacy, which we're probably not going to use very much. There is one we could really do with adding, but we don't need to just yet, so we'll do that a bit later. One of the first things we need to deal with is the alerts, which appear at the top left. 
and these generally tell us when we have something that needs doing. So to start we've got one called Too Few Rivals. This basically is a concept they have in EU for you're expected as a nation to declare people who are your rivals. They're either your enemies, like the English, or they're people you consider yourself to be competing with. I think in most cases these are actually our enemies. But they don't have to be. You could declare a rival as someone who is you see as your equal. I mean, to be fair, England and France, some of the time, they're more like... Not exactly enemies, sometimes. <laughs> In some ways, there can be a bit of friendly rivalry. I mean, the field of a cloth of gold is only a hundred years in the future, in theory, should that happen. But yeah, so we need to select these. Basically, we shields are empty. We need to put people in them. Now, we actually, on this occasion, have been given no choice at all. Ideally, we want three rivals, and we only have three to choose from. When you are choosing them, if you do get a choice, the these can be quite handy. These two columns here give an idea of how powerful they are compared to you. So England at present is more powerful than us, especially the Navy. Need to bear that in mind with England's Navy. It's going to cause us lots of problems when we take the fight to their home. Our army's comparable. The other two are less powerful than us, but Austria has a special position. They're the Holy Roman Emperor, so they're not to be messed with if we can avoid it. But they're going to be our rival. The opinion is what they think of us. It's worth noting that in every statistic in Europa Universalis 4, green is good, red is bad, yellow is neutral, which you won't see as often. So we're just going to select these three rivals. I should probably put them in the same order they appear in the enemies list, but never mind. Okay. So, you'll see there that the alerts disappeared. It's worth noting that you can also get to this screen, if we just close it, by clicking on our lovely large French shield. And it takes us to this general administrative screen that has all of these options. Lots of options. And this particular one is the diplomacy screen. So, that's where we set our rivals, and it's also where we see a lot of things about ourselves which we'll get into in a bit. So the second alert is free advisor slot. So this takes us to our, I suppose our royal house page, but also our advisors. This is very important. There are three basic attributes which we keep track of here. Administrative power, diplomatic power, and military power. I think they're generally called monarch points. These are really important. We want as many of these as we can get. More important than almost anything else we can have. So what happens is every month that passes in the timeline, we will get more of these. And they're used for a lot of stuff, primarily acquiring new technology, but everything beyond that. It's just the general power our ruler has. So the ruler himself is Charles VII. Adds 4, 2, and 4. So he's good at administrative, good at military, not so good at diplomatic. These attributes go from 0 to 6 for the monarch. Down here, it tells us how many we actually get a month. So you'll get 3 as a basis, and then you'll add the king. From there, you can actually add further with advisors. And some other things. But at the moment, every month we're getting 7, 5, and 7. Arguably, administrative is the most important Military is the second most. Diplomatic is probably the least. Some people might disagree. And we also have the attributes of our air. So we can see what's coming up with the Dauphin. And the ages as well. So it gives us some idea when our rulers might die. But bear in mind, you know, we're just starting. Coming up to the Renaissance, people can die any time. Which can be a serious problem in a Christian country. Because you can get personal unions, which again, we will get into later. Now before we set advisors, it's generally important to check the economy tab. So we move along to economy. There's a lot of information here. Really, the one which really matters is this, the balance. This is how much money we're making per month. It's in green, so we are gaining money. 
and we're gaining 2.21 ducats. Now, if we look at the advisor screen, start with administrative, there are three different powers of advisors, at least with no DLCs. Plus one, plus two, plus three. And that basically covers how much they add per month. However, they also cost a certain amount of ducats per month. Realistically, we can only afford one advisor at two ducats a month. I think these must be cheaper than usual, actually, because I think they're normally four ducats per month if they're plus two. Or we could afford two advisors at one ducat per month. <laughs> we can't afford to have three advisors, basically, so we're going to have to pick and choose. Now, as well as the basic edition, which normally you'd favour administrative and military, although because our ruler is weak on diplomatic, we might want to favour diplomatic, they also each have special abilities. So we've got production efficiency plus 10%, that gives us more money. Yearly inflation reduction, that is useful, but not so much now, because we haven't had time to build any inflammation up. And stability cost modifier, again, kind of useful, but not something we're going to be doing in the immediate future. So this is probably the most useful anyway. However, let's just check the diplomatic, make sure there's nothing really good. Okay, so the plus one is trade efficiency, which again is money. There's also a spy network construction, which can be useful, but money's probably more useful right now. And there's one for improving relations, but he's a plus two, and that's not important enough for right now for us to go for a plus two advisor. And we also have, now this is interesting, the plus one is morale of armies plus 10%. In the early game, this is very valuable. That's going to really help us win battles. So, honestly, yeah, let's definitely go for him. So that's taken our balance of money down to 121. So we have enough trade efficiency or production efficiency. I might go for production efficiency because administrative is more valuable. And we'll leave it there. We will look at ways to increase our income so we can have a third advisor. Well, that's it. So this alert isn't going to go away because we're still missing a diplomatic advisor. The third alert, there actually aren't very many for France to start with, is another one that's not going to go away. This is quite important for Christian nations. It basically tells us which of our fellow countries do not currently have an heir. Now, it's not that important for ones where the ruler is young, although they could still die, but the ones where the ruler is old. If we have a royal marriage with them, which we're going to be doing in diplomacy, there's a chance we could actually get their country for free. We'll get a personal union over it. The same is true of us if we don't have an heir, which is why it's very important to get an heir as soon as possible, which royal marriages do help with. But it's not something we're going to consider much at the moment, because we need to be preparing for other concerns, rather than hoping for the off chance of a personal union. If you get it, it's great, but it's not something you can guarantee as a rule, except certain countries get it as a sort of part of history. Okay, so... Next bit. Up here we've just got some stats, so we've got the amount of ducats we currently have. This is of course going to change based on the economy screen we saw earlier every month and also anything we spend. We've got manpower. This is the number of spare troops we've got, people ready to substitute when our soldiers get killed. Very important if you're going to war, you want this as high as possible. Sailors, exactly the same as manpower, but for ships, not nearly as important. Naval combat is not as big a thing here, and especially in the early days, whenever we're fighting England, our ships need to stay grounded, because we cannot realistically compete with England. Also, England tends to be allied to Portugal, which is another great naval power, so it's just not happening. But we will try to improve our navy over time. This is stability also very important, can improve everything and we never want it to get below zero. It only goes from minus three to three, so a jump in stability is a big deal. Corruption, pretty important but quite easy to keep down, it just costs money, so we'll just try to keep it at zero all the time if we can. Prestige, also important, a bit like stability, 
but it goes from I think minus 100 to 100. It has a bunch of benefits if it's positive, which get better the more positive it is. So if you see effects from our current prestige, you see we're already getting a bunch of benefits even though it's only plus 8 and it can get to plus 100 so we want it as high as possible. It's basically how we're regarded in the world. Legitimacy is similar to prestige, possibly a little less important, but it's how, yeah, it's kind of more an internal thing and we can run into problems if it gets too low. Starts at 100 but we want to keep it high if we can. Power projection, that again, like these two, has a bunch of benefits if we keep it as high as we can. It's quite hard to control but we will do things that will help. And that's pretty much it. There are four types of person that we have. We're not going to go into them in any great detail. Merchants are already assigned, so we'll leave them where they are. We don't yet have any colonists. We'll cover them when we get to them. We have three diplomats. That's quite important. We're going to use them pretty soon. And we have one missionary, which we don't currently need. They don't really come in until you have provinces which aren't your religion which in this case is Catholic. So right now, he's just going to sit there doing nothing. Okay. So that's the alerts dealt with. So we're back to the shield. What else do we have? Okay, so this bit on the extreme right is states. This is also quite important, especially for France, because we're in a slightly unique position. There are three basic estates which we share power with in our country. And one of the most direct ways to view this power is with the amount of land we have, this pie chart here. So this is us, this is the crown. We have 30% of the land. 50% more of the land is controlled by the nobility who are very powerful in France. 15% is controlled by the clergy and 5% is controlled by the bourgeoisie. They're basically the merchants, the guilds, the traders, the craftsmen. So they're very weak to start with, but will get more powerful, vice versa for the nobility. Clergy will probably lose a bit of power, but not as much as the nobles. But we'll see. To start with, the nobles are very powerful. We will get benefits from keeping them on board, but at the same time, we really need to increase our power. And just as we need to bring all these vassals under our control, we need to make France a country that is properly controlled by us. This is our main weakness right now, and it's one of the first things we need to do, apart from beating up the English. And possibly Brittany if the English chicken out. We'll see. Okay, so to start with... We actually get a little boost. I'm kind of surprised they keep leaving this in. At the beginning, all of our estates have a loyalty of 50%, which is 10% higher, I think. Oh no, it's 18% higher than the, the standard. By the look of it, equilibrium is 32%. Oh, it varies. It varies, okay. But it's very high. It's so high that we can actually start each game by seizing lands. That will take them down to 30% loyalty each, but that's actually not enough to trigger a rebellion, so there is no good reason not to do this, really. So let's go ahead with that. So we now have 34% of the land. Everyone's share has gone down, basically, apart from ours. We've seized a bit of land from each of them. Okay, so their loyalty has all dropped to 30%. That should recover. Bourgeoisie won't recover by much, it'll only go up to 32. Clergy will recover by 8.4, nobility by... Ooh, a lot. So we should leave them some time to recover. We can't do it again straight away anyway, but we'll try to be nice to them. The other thing you can do, which is worth doing, is summon the Diet. This is almost like Parliament, kind of Renaissance-style Parliament, where we invite the Estates to each present their own agenda. So it's generally worth doing this whenever you can. So what do we have? So they've each suggested something. The clergy want us to make friends with the Pope. That is actually a really good idea. The nobility wants us to invest in their lands, which is useful. And the bourgeoisie wants us to increase our commercial presence in a trade node. This can be complicated to do. It's not a bad thing, but you have to be very careful that you've actually got a plan before you do this. I would not attempt this right now. 
So yeah, often these are a good option if the others seem too difficult to do, but at the moment I actually thoroughly agree with the clergy. Okay, so let's go with the clergy. And let's actually set that going with one of our diplomats. So over here, primarily, but also over here, we have a papal state, which is the actual country ruled by the Pope. If we right click on another country, we will go to their diplomacy screen, a bit like ours, which we can get to by right clicking on ours. But with their screen, we have a bunch of options. As well as seeing some of the things, I'm just gonna open these out. We're going to be doing all of these at some point. Nearly all of them. Ooh, where we probably don't want to offer an alliance, we need an alliance with someone more powerful. But the problem we've got at the moment is the Pope has a negative opinion of us. Partly because I think we're allied to Provence, who is their rival. Yes. If the Pope has a negative opinion of you, you're in danger of being excommunicated. Which is really, really bad. So... This is why I agree with the clergy. So all we need to do for this is just select improve relations. It'll send one of our diplomats. You see, we only have two available out of three now. And they're just going to get on with it. This is the Pope's opinion of us. It's already gone up a little. Even with no time passing, which is impressive work for the diplomat. And we can just leave them to it. I don't know if we'll need to do a bit more to actually fulfill what the clergy have asked us to do in their agenda which we can see by hovering over this. Might need to do a little bit more. But if we can get this relationship positive enough, it should ensure against us being excommunicated, which is a real danger for France out of the bat. So it's well worth doing, even if the clergy don't ask for it. Okay, next thing. We have, on our own diplomacy screen, which we can get to by right-clicking or going through the shield, we have at present seven diplomatic relations. All of these, apart from Provence and Scotland, are, are actually vassals. It says leading vassal. They're quite small, they're not going to be a lot of help if the Hundred Years' War kicks off with England again. We could do with someone more powerful. This is going to give us a penalty. What's basically going to happen is if we go above seven, so we go eight out of seven, we're going to lose one diplomatic power per month, so this is going to go down to four. However, it is worth doing. If you can, I would generally go for Castile, which we can. You can only offer one alliance before we start the game going. It won't let you offer two alliances in the same day. And it says here they're going to accept. You can tell by the big green tick, and if you hover over it, it tells you why. It also shows that we can't vassalize them which is something we'll be checking later, which isn't really a surprise, because they're at least as big as us. So let's offer that alliance to Castile. They've accepted, so that's good. If the Hundred Years' War kicks off, it will be treated as England attacking us, in which case it's likely all of our allies will join in. The advantage of Castile is that England's main ally at the start tends to be Portugal, and if we have Castile as an ally, we don't have to worry about Portugal at all. If you look at the relative sizes, Castile can just handle Portugal, and that leaves us free to deal with England, which is not going to be a problem. We don't, we won't need to actually take the fight to England themselves the first time, we will just attack them on the coast. The other thing we might want to do, just in case England gives us Maine and doesn't fight, is prepare to attack Brittany. Don't currently have any allies. I'm sure they will have some allies at some point. They're already an enemy of Provence, and if we don't move quickly to take Brittany as France, we may find that Provence beats us to the punch. We both have a shared border with them. Hopefully, we'll have more than just a shared border. If England gives us Maine, we can start <laughs> eating into Brittany a lot, but we definitely want Brittany at some point. So, I'm basically preparing for two wars here. I hope this is making sense. I'm preparing for the Hundred Years' War to kick off again, where we'll fight England with all of our allies and basically kick them at least partly off the continent. Or if England backs down and just gives us Maine, then we're going to go for Brittany. So what we do if we're preparing to attack, if we click Declare War, which we can safely do just to look at what we're dealing with, we're going to lose two stability. This thing up here, which would be disastrous. 
because we've got no reason to attack. Casus Bellis is a reason for war. Basically, we need an excuse. We need an excuse to attack them. So what we're going to do is we're going to cancel that. And on our diplomacy screen, we're going to go down to Covert Actions. And we're going to ask one of our, our final remaining diplomats, because one of them is busy sealing the alliance with Castile. Our final remaining diplomat is going to start building a spy network in Brittany. It's a bit unfriendly, and we could try to make friends with them instead and things, but we've already got, if we right-click on ourselves again, 8 out of 7 diplomatic relations, so we don't really want friends right now. So what we're going to do is fabricate claims to their lands and just start eating away at them piecemeal. The main thing we want right now is to take Nantes, because we don't want Provence to do it. And you can usually only fabricate a claim on a land you're directly connected to. So if we can take this province, then we can basically take the rest of Brittany at our leisure over the years. It's a bit nasty, but that's how things were back then. Okay, so if we go back to the shield, I think we're <laughs> nearly at the point where we can set the clock going. Let's just check the other things we need to look at. Most of them aren't things we need to look at right now. We do have this, Subjects, where you can keep an eye on our five vassals. At the moment, we can't do anything about these apart from improve our opinions of us. So we get a handy little guide here as to what they think of us. They're all reasonably keen, but they could be keener. A vassal's opinion of you can go to plus 200, so we could raise that much higher. Uh, we also have this, which is important. This is Liberty Desire. If this gets above 50, there's a danger they might rebel. So at the moment we're fine, which is why it's in green. Ideally, we'd like it at 0%. But yeah, we need to keep an eye on these. We need to keep them on board. At the moment, they will be helping in our wars. They are contributing some money to us. It's all good. It's how much they're providing. Okay, other things. Military tab. This is very important as well. In order to protect ourselves and to keep a decent standing in the world, we need to ideally keep our army as strong as possible. So there are only actually two major things we need to worry about here. In fact, probably this one is the major one. Land force limit. The army is much more important than the navy. And at the moment we have 27 troops out of a possible 37. Ideally, we want to get that to 37. But armies are expensive, so we may not be able to do that straight away. We also have a similar screen for the Navy. We currently have 14 ships out of 16. So if you go above that limit with the army, you are harshly penalised financially, so it's best not to. Navy, you've got some leeway, but it's generally best not to. The other interesting thing you can do on this screen, apart from look at the leaders, which we can get to lead our armies, is you can mothball your forts. We have a few of these, you can sort of see them on the map. There's one here, it's slightly obscured. And they cost a certain amount of money to run, which we can see in the economy screen. Fort maintenance is currently four ducats per month. So I'm guessing that's Paris, Charter, Haupoitou, and Norbonnet. So yeah, apologies for the terrible pronunciations. If we mothball them, they no longer function as forts, which is dangerous, but there are no rebellions upcoming, probably no wars upcoming. If a war starts, they'll instantly be unmothballed. So we can kind of safely do that. And it does actually increase our income. I'm not going to use that to get another advisor right now, but it will be handy for giving us additional money. Okay, so you can see how it's gone down to two. It's been halved. Okay, brilliant. Right, so we are going to cover that a little bit more, the army. But I do want to look at this last tab. I think we can ignore the others for now until we get going. This is the missions tab. This is really useful, especially the first time you play a country, because it gives you an idea of how you're expected to play them. You don't have to follow these missions at all. This is an open-ended strategy game. You can play... France however you like, you can do it completely differently, you could be completely peaceful if you want, be a bit of a waste of the most powerful European nation, but you can. 
So here are the things that we're expected to have. If you have DLCs, these may be different. They do change them, but this is the basic one. So reconquer Normandy. Not surprisingly, this is all about beating up Britain. England, I should say. Not Britain at the moment. Scotland's our ally in their part of Britain. Britain's basically the island. Although sometimes Great Britain has been used to talk about a country as well, but Great Britain is actually just the name of this island, as opposed to Little Britain, which is here, Brittany. But yeah, so it's England that we're hopefully going to be kicking out of Normandy. Uh, build to force unit limit is a standard one. That's get your army to 37 in this case, but the bigger our country gets, the more this will grow. But it, there are advantages to fulfilling any of these. So if we can do that, that would be great. French naval power is similar, but we need to have 20 heavy ships. As you'll note, once again, it's all about rivaling England. Uh, high income tends to take care of itself, so I'm not going to worry about that one. As the country grows, we our income will just go up. And reconquer Gascony is again about beating up the English. That's the lands down here. So yeah, it's all about beating up the English. But you'll note further down, there is one for subjugating Brittany, which is why I'm picking on them as an alternative to the English. So I'm basically trying to follow the mission tree up to a point while getting as powerful as possible. So I think that's it for our shield. What else do we need? Okay, so we've also got two armies. These are the land armies. They're represented by our shield, a little flag that comes off them, tells us how powerful they are, and when we click on them like this, we get a breakdown of what they actually are. So in this case, armies tend to be separated into infantry, cavalry, and artillery. At the moment, we don't have any artillery, we don't have a technology. I'm not going to explain why, but generally, you should try and have four cavalry in every army. So that's perfect, this one's fine already. And we've got 11 infantry. So at the moment we want 4 cavalry and as many infantry as we can do. I personally like to have, to start with, two armies that are identical. Which these currently are not. So, yeah, we're going to want to increase the smaller one. There is also an option for giving them a leader. So I'm going to give this one our best lead. Actually, there's not much in it. You can sort of see how good they are by these little pips. But once we put them in the army, you can also see by these stars here. So the stars go from zero for no leader at all to three for the best leader. So two is actually really good. We won't see that again for a while after this general dies. And I just want to move this army closer to the English. So you can either select the army by clicking on them. Preferably, I usually just aim for the green flag. Or you can actually drag across, which allows you to select multiple armies. And I just want to move them a little closer to the English. Right now. Let's select this one. We'll give them the other leader. The one that isn't assigned. Also two star. And I'm going to move them over here. So they're just across the border from Bordeaux. Okay. Nine and three. So ideally I want another cavalry and two more infantry to make these the same. Okay, so to get additional troops, we can go to this, the production interface. This gives us the option of lots of different things we can buy, but in this case, we're right where we want to be, so we want the cavalry, which at the moment is the chevauchet. So I'm going to ask them to be built in the area they're going to. We would like some infantry, but we can't afford them. We're down to seven ducats now, and we need ten for the infantry, so that will have to wait. So that just leaves a navy. We've actually got two navies. And the reason there are two is that one of them is for trade, and contains only light ships. And the other one is our actual navy, which contains two heavy ships and eight transport ships. Okay, so light ships first. These aren't really intended for combat, but they can be given missions. In With no DLCs, the basic game, your only mission is protect trade. And this basically is good for money. So we've got a choice of four trade nodes, and this is automatically activated the trade map so we can see where they are. We don't really need to understand this right now. What we want to do is just check 
the total change estimate. It's basically, it gives you a clue as to what you should do. All of these, we're going to be losing money except for Bordeaux. So we'll just send it to Bordeaux. The only other thing to remember is that we always want to select this. This basically tells it that when a war kicks off, it should go to the nearest friendly port, otherwise it will get massacred by an enemy navy. Especially when we're playing as France, and our first war may be against England and Portugal. So we'll leave that active. You can see it's active by the lines going around. Okay, so that's good. And then the other navy. So those are light ships. Light ships are what we tend to use to protect trade. The other navy tends to contain uh, heavy ships, galleys, and transports. Galleys are kind of <laughs> light military ships. So they're not the light ships, is why we don't call them that but they're less powerful military ships. The reason we would use them is they're much cheaper and they have an advantage in internal seas, such as the Mediterranean. However, as France, we are ultimately going to be a colonial power, so we're gonna be out on the high seas, so we're really gonna want heavy ships, not galleys. I'm not planning to get any galleys at all. And you can sort of see that because France doesn't start with any. It's kind of giving us a hint. So we start with two heavy ships, and eight transports. So transports allow us to move our army from shore to shore. So they're very ex important for us because later when we want to actually attack England in England, the size of the army we can land is going to depend on our transport ships. In some ways are almost more important than our heavy ships right now because we've just got no chance of fighting a naval battle. So we may as well just move our army. But right now we're not gonna get any more of those because we don't have the money. I think we're almost ready to actually start the game, so that'll be episode over. <laughs> so the only other thing worth bearing in mind is our army and navies. Armies and navies are in green, they have green flags. Allied armies and navies are in blue. At the moment the only ones showing in blue are our vassals, because they're always allied. But once a war kicks off we would expect to be able to see Castiles, Provences, and Scotland's armies also in blue and enemy armies will be in red neutral or in grey which is every other country at the moment so yeah I hope that makes some kind of sense the only other thing I completely forgot to mention is that this alert popped up too many diplomatic relations which is because we made an alliance with Castile should note as well, we don't currently have an alliance with Scotland, we're actually doing something we call guaranteeing, which means that if someone attacks them, i.e. England, we will go to war with England, because any excuse to go to war with England. But we're going to turn this into an alliance. It counts as a diplomatic re relation, whether it's an alliance or a guarantee, so it just makes sense to make it an alliance. The old alliance, in fact, as it is known. So yeah, I think that is pretty much it. We need to try and stay as powerful as possible because Burgundy will take any opportunity to attack us, as will England. And I don't think there's much else we need to consider. Maybe might be worth mentioning those, but maybe we'll do that next time because right now we don't really come into it and we will want, at some point want to add another map. But for now, I think we should leave it there. So I'm sorry if it was a bit boring, but there is quite a lot of setup to do. Next time we will have more action. But yeah, have that made sense? And I will uh, see you next time.